Hi, this is Ed Cohen on Global TV Talk Show, and I'm in downtown San Diego, just across from uh, Seaport Village, right over there. And our special guest is in North LA County, Gary Sanger. Welcome. Well, good afternoon. Nice to be here, Ed. How are you? That's great. Gary Sanger uh, is an excellent, excellent resource uh, and, and retained search. He'll tell you a lot better than I will. Sanger Associates, that's S-A-E-N-G-E-R, SangerAssociates.com, expert in uh, the mid-market, corporate mid-market of uh, retained executive search. Gary, why don't you do it a little bit better than me? I think you did it spot on. We're a headhunter. We're a retained executive search firm. We partner with companies. We help companies fill out their senior management and executive teams. Our uh, focus would be anything to do with manufacturing, supply chain, engineering, R&D, and the like. And the industry verticals where we do most of our work in would be industrial products, would be aerospace and defense, and would be uh, consumer products. Well, so we like to partner with our clients and Southern fill out California. their dance team. Yeah, it's perfect for Southern California, right there in LA Metro. So recently, uh, so as you know, I'm in the news business, so I get a lot of news stuff, and then I pick and choose what I publish. Um, and Deloitte sent me a report recently, maybe you've seen it. Uh, so we published it in our newspaper, our online newspaper, which we call IQ which you will Very nice. have IQ once you read the darn thing. So Deloitte and something called Workplace Intelligence a Research Firm uh, did a survey of their customers and others that came up and said the following, I'm going to read it. 70% of the respondents were corporate people, 70% C-level execs are considering leaving their job for another one that they think might better support them well-being wise. Secondly, 76% of higher ups in their survey, I'm reading this, said the pandemic has negatively impacted them personally over the past two years. 57%, this is the last one, 57% overall of everybody they asked questions said they were fed up enough to quit. So let's go back to the 70% of C-level execs saying they're considering leaving for another opportunity somewhere out there that will um, help them be um, their well-being or whatever. So as a as retained executive search executive, um, is that ringing true with you? Well, I'm surprised at the 70 plus percent, but a typical call for us, I mean, we're a retained firm. I founded the firm in 99, so we've been doing it a while. That's 1999, not 1899, yet, <laughs> as you're already thinking of that. But I think execs talk to us because number one, they know it's safe. They know we're on a confidential basis. We're not going to disclose them and most of our Corporate clients, you know, want to keep their uh, search confidential. But I, I think the following are some real examples of, of why they talk to us, you know, why they share their, uh, you know, their thoughts about what they might want to do next. Number one, they're not in alignment with what that corporation wants to do. I think there's top, typically an issue with bosses, you know, their boss, their board, you know, perhaps isn't listening or paying attention or appreciating them that much. Oftentimes there's a uh, imbalance with their compensation and what their expectation might be. The COVID world has put a strain on everybody, no question. Yeah. And the essential businesses have most of their folks having to be there in person, you know, rather than to work, work hybrid. You got families, my goodness, you know, the families and especially that mom who now is perhaps the two hat person that also has a day job and is the mom and is the wife. You know, the homeschooling of kids has been brutal. So 
I think that's been as hard on anybody, uh, on them as anybody, as it relates to how difficult it is. So 70 plus percent, you know, that might be 20, 30% higher than what I would experience normally over the last 25, 30 years. So earlier, in an earlier show that uh, we had you as a guest, uh, you were talking about the market being out of whack, the, the supply and demand issue as it relates to your industry. Is that still true? Yes, yes. And, and maybe a crazy analogy. You got anybody out there dealing with the supply chain and trying to get stuff from Asia or Europe here or what you have stacked up outside the ports or some of the slowdown and stoppage in, in China. I think that imbalance also has happened. There's a big, big demand for senior executive and, and uh, senior management people. And the supply is simply small. You got some folks that have said, screw it, I don't wanna do this anymore. You know, I'm tired of it, just like the report you just mentioned. And you know, some of them, them are saying, look, this balance of life or lack thereof is something that I wanna fix. I've gone through a marriage or two. I've got kids that are estranged. I wanna get back in touch because this is a one trip through my life and I'd like to get better balance on that. Well, spoken like a good guy, I'll tell you. Well, good, I'm 49 and a half years of being married to my wonderful wife. I'm a very thankful person. No, oh, bless you, wow. So, um, there's competition. I mean, you are retained executive search. You're not out pounding bushes or something. You know, you're, you, you are a, a team member. Yeah, I'm not contingency, no knock on them, but we're retained exclusively by the company to partner with them and fill out their senior management or executive positions. That's correct. Now, how much of that is like interim, like your needs, they need, your customer needs to fill a role, we've got to get some fresh, the, the person saying, I need somebody new, I need somebody who's more people oriented, I need somebody who's more customer focused, not just product, but can we build a relationship with a customer so the customer has a better experience with us, and therefore we, we retain that customer long term. So they, you, you, their, their need is long term, but <laughs> Do you also find people on a short-term basis, which may turn out to be a long-term? You know, that's very seldom that we would go after an interim assignment. If it were specifically in our uh, sweet spot and we had folks to be available within a few weeks, that would be the exception. But we're more focused on, and we are focused on that long-term. And what about uh, the importation? If, uh, are you looking to import somebody from overseas? No, uh, we have done that some. I mean, we have one assignment now that is likely to happen where um, it's involving Ukraine mm -hmm. and they are gonna be looking for expats from the US to go there in the oil and gas industry. Now, whether that happens or not, you know, you've got the terrible conflict there and whether they in fact pull the trigger to go hire 10 to 15 experts in the oil and gas uh, business, it remains to be seen. That's, that's combat duty, boy. That is, no, that is combat duty. And yeah. you know, it's uh, the conflict itself is unbelievable. Yeah, just awful, sickening. Um, so one of the things that I've read about, <coughs> excuse me, is the recruiting process can be overwhelming itself, right? Well, it can be, and for many, if this executive has been in business for 20 years, he or she may have only done this a couple of times. So they're not very well equipped with what they wanna do next. They may not have the resume put together. And so for them to go and invest some time and invest some brain power in terms of what they wanna do next, you know, I think you have to, it's the war for talent. And again, this imbalance in terms of supply of senior management and execs is smaller than what the demand is. I think you have to have a compelling brand and opportunity and company in terms of what it's trying to do. Why does that company exist? And when you look at that company, what's it trying to do? It has an opportunity for a senior management or an executive 
to go attract new clients, new customers, and bring in new revenue, or to perhaps expand and grow into a new market or a new geography, having that clarity, and then knowing that if it's going to be a relocation, it's brutal to try to relocate people from the Midwest or Southwest or Southeast into either coast, because the East Coast or the West Coast, my goodness, the expensiveness of that. We've got a couple of deals happening now where the person is in Michigan, is in Wisconsin, is in the Midwest, and they're being moved here to, uh, to California. Well, off the top, you're just about having to raise 80, 85% to make the base bonus be equal. And then their house there is 400 grand. And the small side of what might be available here is 800 or 900,000. So the price tag is big. So there really isn't a full flat open market in terms of trying to get execs to move to the high cost of living areas. It's very, uh, very challenging and very expensive. So the obvious question to me is, uh, and I'm not in your business at all, um, is uh, why don't you just stick to the, the coastline, particularly the West coastline, where the cost of living is relatively the same, whether it's Seattle or, or Bay Area or, or Southern California? Well, most clients do, and that's a very good po point. But if you look at LA, you, you look at it, LA here, I'm in Santa Clarita, you know, Six Flags Magic Mountain. So if you've been a tourist, yep. if you look at LA, you look at Orange County, you look at San Diego, those are five or six different markets. And yep. am I going to go drive two hours? No. Oftentimes. God forbid. <laughs> yeah, most won't. But most of them, you know, unless it's an hour or less commute, there's going to be relocation, you know, to happen. And so the price tag of that is this big, it's complicated. And then you got kids and schools and grandparents and second jobs. You know, the complexity of that is, uh, is not simple. Yeah, so um, in terms of the placements, the successes that you've had during yes. uh, so far this year, how does it stack up against 12 months ago? We're extremely busy now. Oh, good. We are extremely busy now. We primarily deal in companies that are essential businesses, you know, but we also, you still have, I have the typical hundred degree difference is, you know, I <laughs> guess today there might be a 90 degree temperature difference if we're in the spring or in the winter and yeah. I'm being sarcastic, but also being honest. You well, know, where, course, it, where you are is semi-desert and well, I would say yeah. you're, you're almost like Palm Springs, but not that hot. But still, my client's location is what I'm referring to. And so uh -huh. if there's zero, 10 below, 20 below in the Midwest, and this might be the umpteenth time they've gone through that winter, we've got a client right now that's going to be moving a couple of executives from the Midwest hmm. here either to Southern California or to Arizona. That's appealing. And after a while, shoveling that white stuff. I've been there. I've done that. I'm a farm boy from Idaho, and I've lived in Chicago. I've lived in New York. I'm not living in that stuff anymore. Sorry, thank right. you, and uh, no thank you. I'm not even traveling to those places at that time of year. <laughs> Amen. Yeah. No more. And if you are, it's briefly. It's briefly. <laughs> oh, it's combat pay. Well, and again, I want to add, Ed, the competition for talent now, pre-COVID, we were getting an average of four, five, six other offers from other companies for our final candidate. We're approaching that again now. Hmm. So the demand is large. And when he or she has other opportunities that they're considering, how do you win? How do you make sure that your client is the winner at the end of it? And I think in some ways, if this business, if this job in this business is going to impact 50 million, $100 million worth of business, should you care as much as most companies do for another 50 grand to land the person in terms of what it's going to take for base, what it's going to take for performance opportunity, what's it going to take for a sign on so they don't walk away and lose their current bonus program that they're on. You know, my point is get out of your own way when mm -hmm. you in fact need to be flexible to make a deal 
and land somebody. So is that why you um, you've said to me uh, in the past, um, untrained, quote unquote, untrained or non-trained um, leaders that hire you, that retain you for the search, they sometimes think they know better than you, right? And get in, get in your way. Well, I want to be careful. I'm not calling them untrained or not. <laughs> that's, not that's, have... that's my words, my words. No, I understand. <laughs> All right, so I'll blame it on Ed. For yeah. That particular part. But no, I think you have to be less arrogant at times in terms of your company's not the only game in town. I think you have to look at he or she may have five or 10 years with their current company and they're coming in brand new into your organization or client. And so how are you gonna make it attractive for them to do that? I think it also means, do you absolutely have to have a narrowly defined industry background to fit your company to be successful? Oftentimes there can be sister industries, you know, that in fact might give you new thinking a new perspective in terms of how they could perform that job. Boy, that's interesting. So is there a change in male, female uh, regarding the, the search? I don't think there's a change in that the progressive company, they may look at their organization and say, look, we are imbalanced or over, overpopulated with a certain type of background, with a certain type of education whether male or female, but I think in general, you're looking for the best athlete for the, for the right. position. You're looking for the right. best background. You know, there are some clients that would say, look, you know, this really ought to be male or this ought to be female, or we want to have a new expertise with this kind of technology. Uh, you then say, look, I want A and B and C in terms of this educational background or this is the model of a company that I'd like to emulate. And so therefore our target companies would be on that uh, hit list, if you will, in terms of where we're gonna go hunt. So as we come to a close, I wanted to ask you about something I was reading about yesterday. Uh, you know, I get up early, uh, 5 a.m. or so, put on the computer. So uh, you can't sleep, right, Ed? I could, oh, no, I, I, I fall asleep that. 10, uh, you know, 9, 30, yes. 10. But by the time five comes, hey, it's enough. So um, so I read a lot at the, the no, that time, it's total focus, <laughs> cup of coffee, you know, and so I can absorb stuff. So one of the things I was reading about um, yesterday morning, it just struck me, I was like gong, you know, I had to write it down. So I started taking notes. I was like in college again. Yeah, that's notes. good for you. I hope you passed the course. I hope so too. But here's the question to you. Um, are, have you come across somebody looking for a marketing person uh, to fill a position, a senior position uh, with a new name and the name on the article that I read <laughs> was CCO, Chief Customer Officer. I have and, not. I've heard of it. We've not had a search that's been focused that way. So it was uh, a Harvard but think, article. Yeah, and, but I think and what they, it's saying, Ed, sorry, yeah. go ahead. Well, they, 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 it was a Harvard, so a little brainy. But uh, they, they, they were talking, so the guy was talking about um, it's a political very sensitive position because you can't be a smart ass because there's other smart people at the sea level and the you're going to report to the ceo um, but so isn't the chief marketing officer or the chief product officer never mind the cfo or the cio um, so chief customer officer in the article um quickly they said it's the experience that that customer that you now have. Customers today want more experience with the supplier. Uh, so if you if that person is your customer and you've had that customer for a while, what have you done to more interact with them humanly <laughs> so that they feel there's more of a viable relationship and that's 
chief customer officer as opposed to the marketing person who sells sell, sell. okay but relating to and getting to understand how the customer uses your product or may need another product and that may relate to retuning up your own product to give that customer a stronger uh, business experience blah 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 what you're making me think of is really turning an organizational chart upside down hmm. and having that organization report to the customer Whoa. and so the customer is king and queen he or she tells you what they like what they buy what they return what they pay for etc and i think those fantastic companies and it doesn't matter if it's industrial it doesn't matter if it's consumer you know, what is it that that customer wants? And I think the execs that we are hiring most of the time, if they're outward facing, and how are you really in touch with what that customer wants and doesn't want? I think many times, you know, you build something and they will come. Well, not always the case. You right. build something that they might like, what widget they might have. You know, some of those are in demand, some of those aren't. And I think that company, that client, that, uh, that exec team and that board that really is in tune with what the customer wants. I think what you've just said is golden. I think the idea of whether you're in a staff job or a line job, if you're in a general management position or you're head of sales, you darn well better be in heartbeat with that customer. And not only where they are today, you know, the Gretzky's of the world always knew where the puck was going to be. Yeah. Right. Where is it going? And the statistics I read that say in the next 15 years, 10 years, 40% of the jobs we have today won't be there anymore because there'll be new jobs that are being created. And probably as not out of tech or maybe some useful uh, tech application, but out of the needs of the people and then figuring out how to take what you already have and bend it, twist it around to fit that customer's needs. That's going to lock in that customer, won't it? I think so. Yeah, I think the, uh, you know, the uh, mental attachment, that's not the word I'm looking for. The, the buy-in and the loyalty and the, you know, you know that that company is making something that you want and need in it, stuff you've had before and where it's going. Uh, I think that loyalty is a big, big thing. Gary Sanger, uh, if I were a C C CEO, I'd, I'd hire you. I retain you for executive search. It'd be a pleasure. <laughs> I'd love to serve you and fill out your senior management and executive team. Ed, it's real pleasure. Thank you. Real pleasure for me to be here today. I would uh, love to do this again. Okay, great. Okay, in July. So, um, uh, so I'm developing a series of uh, shows. I haven't done it yet, but I'm developing it up here <laughs> about what does CCO mean to you? And then having some people come on and discuss, you know, sort of like that blue ocean topic that we did a month or two ago. Yeah, exactly. Well, and exactly. The customer is what to your company? Mm. The company, the customer is what to your new product, your R&D? you know, your efficiencies on what you make bigger, better, faster, cheaper, uh, that customer piece of it is really enticing to me as a, you know, a very juicy topic, quite frankly, because simply without a customer, you know, what's that uh, company doing here? Yeah, right. Gary Sanger, it's S-A-E-N-G-E-R. Go check it out on LinkedIn. Ciao. Thank you, sir. Ciao. Bye-bye. Thank you.